Penny Wright. We have such a nice audience here today, and we're grateful to you all for being here. And of course, we're grateful to the Southampton History Museum, our co-sponsor in so many what we consider very fine events. And today uh, is represented by Connor Flanagan, who's the director of education there, and he's been working in that capacity for, now this will be his fourth year. He started as an intern, and look where he is now. <laughs> Connor has a BA in history from Aurora University in Aurora, Illinois, and he attended Bishop McGann Mercy High School in Riverhead, so he's a, he's a local guy here. He's always loved history, and in college he learned that he really enjoyed the little histories and focusing in on individual experiences that went along with bigger ideas and themes. Which is why the story of Pierre's concert appealed to him. His appearances, Pierre's concert's life story connects perfectly to the bigger ideas of slavery in America and the whaling industry on Long Island, about which Connor has spoken very well here at the library. Um, so, uh, Connor has done lots of research. Some of it has been in collaboration with Brenda Simmons, who's the director of African American, the African American Museum. Unfortunately, she's out of the country right now, couldn't be here, but we're grateful to her too, and we're very pleased. Please welcome Connor Flanagan. Hi everybody, thanks for joining me here. Um, as Penny was just saying, everything that's in this uh, presentation today and all the research I've done has been in collaboration with Brenda Simmons, who was actually just emailing me yesterday. Hi Brenda, she was excited that it's going to be recorded. Um, so she could see all the updates and uh, research that I've been able to find. So without further ado, let's get started. So the story of Pierce Concert starts first here at Cooper's Hall, so not exactly here, but very close by on the property, Cooper's Hall. Uh, it was originally built by Nathan Cooper in 1805. Nathan Cooper was a merchant and became very wealthy. And according to census records in, uh, from 1800, Cooper had four slaves. Uh, one of them was named Dad Williams, Esther Williams, uh, Violet Williams, and Rachel Williams. Uh, they were a family, Dad and Esther were the parents, Violet, Rachel, and the children. In 1803, uh, Dad was able to get his freedom by going on a whaling journey and using the money that he made from the whaling journey to purchase him and his wife's freedom in 1803. Uh, his children, however, remained as slaves here with the Cooper family. Um, fast forwarding 10 years to the 1810 uh, federal census data, Nathan Cooper's household showed him living with three white females, um, or three white males, sorry, his two young sons and an unknown third person, uh, two free males, being himself and another unknown person, I guess maybe a brother, something like that, and his nephew was the other child. Um, a female who is younger, most maybe his daughter, another younger female, and an older female, and about 45 and over, potentially his wife. Um, he had four other free persons that were on this property, most likely Gad Williams, who was about 35, Esther, who was 39, Millicent and Prince, who were their two children uh, that they had after they were no longer slaves uh, here on the property as well. And then there was Violet, Rachel, and then a third slave, who I'm not sure who that was. But uh, in 1810, they were all living here. And so why we are talking about Gad Williams and Esther Williams and Nathan Cooper. Um, we'll find out in a second. So also I have a few of these maps uh, highlighting just where we're talking about in the village, in case you're not familiar, you just want to see pictorial representation. So those maps were in 1873, and Cooper's Hall is marked just about there. So Pierce was born March 17th, 1814, and he was born to Violet Williams and a man named William Shadrach Concert. Pierce became the responsibility of Nathan Cooper. So at this time, Violet Williams was still a slave to the Cooper family, but Pierce, as he was born, was actually not technically known as a slave. He was known as what is called an indentured servant. So, there's always a big question. What's the difference between a slave and a veteran servant? Um, the short answer is, not that much. Um, so, on March 29, 1799, the New York State Legislature passed an act of gradual abolition of slavery. What essentially this meant was any child born after July 4, 1799 was known as a free person. 
this was an act so that New York could slowly start the, the end of slavery. But they, they didn't want to cut it off just there and make everybody suddenly free. They wanted to make it a slow, gradual process. So if you were born after that date and your mother was a slave, if you were a male, you would be a, a, a servant until you're 28 and a female until you're 25. <coughs> Pierce being born after this time period, there was no issue. He was born an indentured servant. Um, they were the responsibility of whoever the owner of their mother was, and they had to be registered with the state. Um, there was a 12 cent fee for registration, and it had to be done by the time the child was nine months old. There would be a $5 plus $1 for every extra month fine for not registering the child. Uh, Nathan Cooper was a little slow on this and was fined $38 because he didn't actually register peers at birth until 1816. So, except for the difference between a slave and an interest servant, there really wasn't much. The really big crux of it is slavery was definitely for life, and servitude lasted until year 25, 28 but they still had to live under the power of another person. Everything they did in their lives were dictated by their owners. Um, you couldn't exactly sell an indentured servant, but you would buy their servitude. So it was, all intents and purposes, basically the same scenario. Nathan Cooper died December 4th, 1817. He was survived by his wife, Olive, and their children, Mercator, Margaret, and Gilbert. At the time of his death, his family and their slaves and indentured servants all continued to live on the Cooper property. And in 1819, Pierce was either sold or his servitude was transferred to the Peltro family upon Cooper's death. So in all the research and documentation I've been able to find on Pierce, which I actually have a lot of it with me here next to me, so after the talk, if anyone's interested, you can look at a lot of the primary sources I've found, <coughs> um, there has been no bill of sale or a transfer of ownership of Pierce. But there's a lot of oral history being told that he was sold and when he was about five years old in 1819, for $25, which is still <coughs> a really, really horrible situation. Imagine a five-year-old child being taken away from their family and sold at five years old. <coughs> so he, as I said, was sold to the Pelletro family. And if we look at the 1820 census data, we find the census data leaves us with a little bit of a mystery. So as I said before, it's been an oral history that this was about the time that his uh, life changed and he was sold from his family. But looking through the Cooper's census records, the Pelletro census records, can actually find documentation of where Pierce was. Granted, this isn't exactly uh, saying that his sale at five years old was not true, because oftentimes people of color, women, um, anybody under that category, if you weren't a rich white guy, they didn't really take the best care to write down your name properly, record where you were, and given that he was a child at this time, he just might not have been around when the census taker came by, and they might have just forgotten to put him on the paper somewhere. But the story goes that his life began with the Pelletros. Pierce was either, as I said, purchased by John Pelletro or Charles Pelletro. <clears throat> John um, died in 1822, and his son Charles took over his ownership, and they had a house down on a, around the corner of Tlotelson and South Main Street. It's a very close spot. And the 1830 census records, Charles' household contained one free person of color that was between 10 and 24 years old. Pierce would have been 16 years old. So it makes sense that Pierce would have been on this property at the time. And as you see here, a portrait of Charles Pelletro. And here's a, a quick breakdown of the Pelletro family. So some of you may be aware of Captain Elias Pelletro. He was a patriot that fought the American Revolution. He also operated the Silver Shop, which is one of uh, the Southampton History Museum's properties that's right on Main Street that anybody can go visit anytime they like now. He operated that business. His son John took up the profession and was also a silversmith. And then his son Charles is the one who we believe purchased, uh, purchased Pierce. So there's a connection right there between the Peltro family here in Southampton and the ownership of Pierce. Can show again the map that we're going to refer to a few more times. Cooper's Hall starting there, and then Pierce down over here where Charles Pelletro's plot of land was. So, except for the 1830 census data, Charles Pelletro had the one free person of color of 10 to 24 years old, where Pierce was 16 at the time. Charles himself never actually married or had any children of his own, but a lot of oral histories tell us that Charles was. The ones who bring up Pierce uh, and the single person of color in that age range, and Pierce, uh, Charles also known as a very religious man, and while never marrying or having kids as his own, the census records as time goes on shows him having a lot of different people in his house, usually a lot of uh, 
single females with their own children. So I'm not sure if he operated almost like a boarding house where he just took in people of need and gave them uh, housing as time progressed. But it was just an interesting fact about Charles where as I was going through up until his death, uh, every year there was just different people living in his house. Believe the last names, different random numbers of people. It was fairly interesting. Um, freedom. So as I said before, as Pierce was an indentured servant, he had freedom in his, at the end of his life potentially. So by the time he would be 28 years old, he would legally be a free man. But abolition in New York ended up just happening a lot sooner than that law really intended it to, where a lot of people just started sort of freeing their slaves sooner rather than later. And then also by 1814, especially on Long Island, there wasn't as much need or want for somebody who didn't have a large farm to really have as many slaves or anything like that. And by the time Pierce was about either 18 or 21, he was able to get his freedom. Now again, one of the most important details about Pierce, no actual documentation about, most annoying. But uh, in his obituary, I believe it says that he got his freedom at 18, but other world history say 21. I lean more towards 18 years old, because that is also the date of his first whaling venture. Um, he may have gotten his freedom the same way his grandfather did, where he went out on a whaling venture, came back with his first bit of money, was able to purchase his freedom, and then operate the rest of his life as a free man. This first whaling trip took place um, on the ship Boston, captained by Edward D. Sayer, and the home pictured right here is right on South Main Street. It was just, this is a recent photo. Uh, it was just recently sold, and it's designated as a historic marker right up front of it, marking it as the home of Captain Edward Sayer. And they sailed from New London, Connecticut, to the South Atlantic in front of Wales. They came back with 1,900 barrels of oil, or baleen oil, and 1,600 pounds of whale bone. His second trip was very soon right after that, at the age of 19 years old. He essentially got back home, hung out for a little bit, and then jumped right back on the boat and headed out to sea in search of more whales, this time with Captain Jeremiah William Hedges on the Columbia. They sailed out of Stag Harbor in June 1833 and returned May 1834. When he was going on these first journeys, he was known as like a green hand or a green. So what that would mean is he was one of the lower ranked guys on the boat doing sort of all the jobs. Just learning the trades, you're essentially an apprentice. So you have to figure out what is it like working on this boat, how did the whole whaling venture entail, these really long, arduous journeys that you'd be going on. As time went on, Pierce became known as one of the most skilled whalers in the village. Uh, he began to grow his experience and eventually became a boat steer, one of the highest ranking positions on a whale ship. What there was was the whaling captain, then there was the first mate, second mate, third mate, fourth mate, depending on how many mates they wanted to have on the ship. And right below that, you would have had people known as the boat steers or harpooners. They would be the ones captaining the smaller vessels that would be lowered from the main whale ships to go down and actually hunt the whales. So the boat steer was responsible for making sure that this boat didn't capsize while they're out in the rough seas trying to capture these whales. And so it would be Pierce's responsibility to keep everybody alive on this boat while out there. This didn't really matter if you were black, white, Native American, whatever it may be. Everybody loved this guy because he made sure that they lived and they were able to actually catch their whales and make their money. So by Pierce having that job and being as good at the job as he was, garnered the respect of every man he ever went out at sea with. Coming to the 1840 census data. It doesn't give us an exact answer to where Pierce was living, but it has some interesting possibilities that have just sort of been mulling over as I've been thinking about this process. On the 1840 census data, we find Gad Cooper, who was his grandfather, who previously was known as Gad Williams. But around this time and for the rest of the time that we find on census data, he took the last name of Cooper. Um, I don't know exactly where his property was, and I'm really trying to figure it out. But he had one free male person of color who was 24 to 35 years old. Shadrach Concert, who was Pierce's biological father, had one free person of color from 10 to 24 years old. And Charles Pelletro, the man who owned Pierce and brought him up from childhood, had a free person of color from 10 to 24 years old. Pierce was actually 26 years old at this time. So if we're just going to go by hard data and imagine that they took down the records properly, it would mean that Gad Cooper was the one that actually had Pierce living with him. Shadrach may have had just another young man living with him. Charles may have had another man, young man living with him. Or Pierce maybe like split time between them and just by the time they got from one house to the other one, he had been there <coughs> visiting or something like that. Unfortunately, they didn't write down the names of everybody. They only had the head of household. But my best guess is that he was living with his grandfather. 
The way we find out that is on the 1840 census records, they actually list the jobs of everybody working in the households. So in the Pelotros, we had two people working in agriculture. Shadrach had one person in agriculture and one person in navigation of canals, lakes, and rivers. And Gad had one person working in agriculture and one in navigation of the ocean. So Pierce, the boat steerer, going on whaling ventures, I'm more inclined to believe that he was the navigator of the ocean, not canals, lakes, and rivers. So my guess would be that he was living with Gad. <coughs> one other fact that really makes that drive home is that Gad's son, Prince, was also a whaler, was also going out on these ventures, actually was listed as his own. He had his own property at this time. And he uh, was listed as working in agriculture, not actually working as a whaler. So that makes me believe that Pierce was most likely living with his grandfather because he was going out, he was probably home for maybe one or two months a year. So he spent most of his time out at sea, so he didn't really need to be home that often. Also, at this time, there was an, an unknown woman of color living in the house. My guess is that it may have been Rachel, who would be Pierce's eventual wife, living in the home with them. She sort of it fits the age range that would have been there. <clears throat> but now we're going to move on to probably the most famous part of Pierce's life, and the, what, the reason that many people know of him, that may not know a lot of the other backstory, where at the start of the 1840s, the American whaling industry was starting to boom. And Pierce is one of the best whalers in the village, as we discussed before. And this man here, Captain Mercator Cooper, was hired, or, or hired Pierce as a boat steer for his 1843 journey to the Pacific Ocean in Hunt of Whales. They set sail on Wednesday, November 8th, 1843, out of Sag Harbor aboard the Manhattan. An interesting fact here is that this Mercator Cooper was the man that took Cooper's Hall from its original structure, beautified it to look more sort of what it looks like today and was the son of Nathan Cooper, who originally owned Pierce's family. So as Pierce was a young child growing up in the house, Mercator was a little bit older, and they knew each other basically from birth all the way up now, so they're going out on this whaling venture. As the Manhattan sailed around the world, it went searching whales all over the Pacific Ocean, and they ended up in 1845 landing at Port Lloyd on what is now known as the island of Chichijima, a lot of Japanese words that I'm not going to pronounce super well. My apologies. It is approximately 100 miles north of Iwo Jima. So this is out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. If you go on Google Maps and you try and look at it, you're not going to find it because it's a little pin drop. you really got to know where you're looking to find it. It's in the middle of the ocean. Port Lloyd is right about there. Um, and it's also where Commodore Perry, if anyone's familiar with his story, he was the man that eventually went to Japan to open up their borders for trade actually owned a bit of property in Port Lloyd there, which is why it's very easy for me to find where Port Lloyd was when I found that name randomly in a document. Um, but they stopped there, and the weather was really, really bad. Uh, they were there in February, so they docked for about a month doing repairs on the boat and resupplying themselves with things like water and vegetables and food and stuff like that from the locals living on the island. After a little bit of time, they ended up uh, setting out back to sea to go and hunt of more whales. On Saturday, March 15th, the day after they left, they stopped off at this island called Torishima, which you can see a picture here in the back. It's a volcanic island out, again, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, pretty close by. Um, and it was thought to be an uninhabited, and the reason they stopped there was to look for sea turtles. Uh, they wanted to mix up the, the food on the boat, so they wanted to capture a few sea turtles who made the nesting there, so they didn't have to eat a bunch of salted pork that's been sitting around the boat for two years at this point. So, uh, Cooper and his crew, as they were approaching the island and surveying, seeing where they wanted to go, came across a weird boat that was sort of damaged on the shores. It looked Chinese in construction, but a little bit different, so they didn't really recognize what it was. As they ventured onto the island and began searching, they came across 11 shipwreck, shipwrecked Japanese sailors. At first, the Japanese were very, very scared. They immediately thought they were going to be killed, and they threw themselves on the ground just asking for mercy, please don't kill us. But none of them spoke English, nobody on Cooper's crew spoke in Japanese, but they were able to figure out from them that they were Japanese, that we're not gonna kill you, we're here to help, and they eventually brought them to the shore. Cooper pointed to his boat and offered to take them home, at which point the Japanese, who had been there for a few months at this point, immediately agreed, left their, all their belongings behind, and as fast as they could, got onto the boat with Cooper. The reason why Cooper was doing this was twofold. One, as a sailor himself, he would have known the great fears of going out to sea and becoming shipwrecked and being trapped, not having any idea where you are or what you're doing. 
So he probably felt a lot of sympathy for them and wanted to take them home. The second one was also knowing that Japan was a closed country. He wanted to be able to go in there and show them that America is not the big bad guy that we need to be afraid of, to try and create a nice diplomatic moment to open communication with Japan. And Japan was really dangerous at this time for foreigners because it was a closed country. Uh, Japan's isolationist foreign policy was referred to as Sakaku, meaning closed country. And this was enacted in the 1600s by Tokugawa Imitsu, um, and it was done to stop Western influence from penetrating Japan. Japan started to notice Western influence penetrating all these other countries and doing a lot of damage. So Japan's idea was to just close off, don't let anybody in, and the only people they allowed trade with were the Dutch, who had a very small port at the bottom of their country, and a few of the neighboring Asian uh, settlements around them, some in Korea, some up in what is now Russia, and a little bit with China. But otherwise, they stopped all Western influence. They didn't want new ideas coming in, like Christianity, to change people's minds, and they wanted to also control all the economy of their country, so they didn't get uh, the Europeans <laughs> coming in and create these massive industries that take over everything like they had been throughout the rest of the world. So on Sunday, March 16, 1845, on their way to mainland Japan, Manhattan, Manhattan came across a heavily damaged boat out in the water that had clearly just either run aground on, some, on a reef that was uncharted or got damaged in a storm of some kind, and managed to save another crew of 11 sailors. That meaning they had 22 Japanese sailors on their boat that they were going to bring home to Japan. On the boat, they took a lot of things before the boat was sinking, like some rigging that was on there. Uh, they were actually salmon fishermen, and the, the men on the Manhattan remarked at the size of the salmon. They'd never seen salmon as large, where once they were split in half and opened, they were four feet in length. Um, gigantic fish. Um, and also on the boat, probably the most important thing was Cooper found a heavily detailed map of Japan and its coastlines. At this time, nobody else had this good of detailed maps of Japan. They kept all that in tier since they had trade that we had access. So Cooper took that map and stashed it away in his boat hidden. So that way, when they eventually got to Japan, if they ever did search their boat, hopefully they wouldn't find the map and he could take it home. And for reference, you can see right over here, on the bottom is where the original <coughs> islands, where they found the first sailors, slightly up higher they find the second ones, and then they gotta go all the way to Tokyo. So it's quite a large, long journey, about a thousand miles, 500 miles, somewhere between there that they have to sail, completely out of their way in search of taking these men home. On Sunday, March 23rd, 1845, there was first light uh, of Japan sighted. And the next day, Cooper's log remarks that they got, as they got closer to the land, they started expecting it, that it looked to be under culture. Uh, here, there's some discrepancy between what is written in Cooper's log book and what is written in an interview that he actually gave in December 1845. While on their way back home, they stopped in Hawaii and gave an interview about the whole situation. Um, in the interview, Cooper said that he landed a little bit north of Tokyo and sent some of the rescue Japanese men ashore and told them to go to Tokyo to warn the government of the boat's intentions. In his logbook, he says that as they approached the land, some fishing boats came up to, to talk to them, see what was going on, and they sent some men onto those boats to send to the government to warn them of their incoming. And thinking about this, I was thinking maybe he was scared that when Javis came on the boat, if they knew how to speak English, they would read his logbook and see he went ashore and get really upset at him, so maybe he lied in there. Or maybe he just embellished the story slightly when he was giving his, his details later on. Not certain. But either way, he did send some men ashore to warn the government, because otherwise an American vessel just approaching the Tokyo Bay would immediately be fired upon. Because that has happened uh, several times before this. In fact, about 10 years before, another ship did the same thing. Found Japanese sailor shipwrecked, sailed right to Japan, take them home, like, oh, we can't take these guys home. And he immediately got fired upon by the land and had to turn away. And I'm not sure what happened to the Japanese sailors. Probably came up to America and just hung out. I'm not sure. So the Manhattan was soon blown right back out to sea due to the rough waves. So being that they were in sort of late winter, early spring, the seas were still fairly rough. So rising out to Japan, sent these men ashore, immediately blown right back out to sea. And an interesting fact, right as they were just getting back, they actually witnessed a volcanic eruption going on out in the waters. Um, in his log books, they, they always draw little pictures of whales when they see them around, and they, there's a very funny drawing of a little <coughs> volcano going off near some whales in his log book. 
Um, but on Friday, April 18th, 1945, <laughs> now back near Japan's coast, a barge approached Manhattan with some fanciful dressed men and a Dutch translator who spoke a little bit of English. And they were able to sort of explain what was going on. And then the Japanese allowed them to come, in, come ashore, almost, where they tied a bunch of ropes to a bunch of smaller boats, about 300 ships with 15 men in each, and towed the large Manhattan back into Tokyo Bay. Once there, they formed rings of boats around the ship. This was to enforce the rule that no one was to go ashore. All the Americans had to stay on their boat, and the Japanese would come to them, but they were not allowed to leave. And they also confiscated all weaponry that the Americans had. So any guns, swords, knives, anything like that was taken. <coughs> Fairly scary situation, I could imagine. Just trying to do a nice thing, and suddenly you're almost held hostage. And an example of how serious the situation was. While the Japanese did create this giant bear, take all the weapons, they were being very nice to them and explaining, just please don't break our rules. So as trying to obey them, Cooper didn't want to be lazy, so they decided to try and repair one of the small boats. As they were lowering the boat down and into the water so they could get at it to do repairs, the Japanese immediately drew all their swords and started to attack the sailors. They were able to stop it, get everybody to understand what they were trying to do, and in the logbook, it actually remarks that they all had a laugh about it. And then they eventually got the boat onto the ship, uh, which the Japanese did by hand without using any, getting it actually into the water. And they actually assisted with the repairs that needed to be done on the boat at the time. So, always funny having a sword shoved in your face and then everybody laughing about it. They spent four days docked there in Tokyo Bay. And when the shipwrecked sailors were finally able to leave the ship, which was most likely occurred on the first day they were there, that's not actually mentioned anywhere in any documentation. Can't imagine they let them sit there for four days, though. Um, it was met with a lot of hugs and tears and thankful goodbyes that they were so happy they were able to be brought home. Um, Manhattan was visited by many people, some dressed beautifully in colored tunics and others in common everyday rags. Um, when the governor, even the governor of Tokyo, visited the ship to pass on messages from the emperor. In Cooper's Land Log on Saturday, April 19, 1845, he states that the gentry is frequently coming on board to view the ship. So while they were there, so many people came on, whether it was higher than government officials or lower rank fishermen, a lot of people had a lot of fun coming on to create these foreigners that they'd never get a chance to probably see ever again in their lives. And this right here is a Japanese painting of the Manhattan in Tokyo Bay. They neglected to include the giant ring of boats around it. But um, a really interesting find. Also right here is what we believe to be potentially a picture of Pierce, um, drawn in the same manuscript where the, the painting of the Pope is from. Um, we're not sure this could be Pierce, it could be Prince Gad, who was uh, his uncle, who was actually on the ship with him as well, or maybe some of the other African Americans that were on there. Um, I have a friend of mine who speaks a little bit of Japanese, and I sent her this, and I asked her to try and translate it. She's not the greatest at Japanese. But she was able to infer that somewhere in here it said, a uh, black like ste uh, steerer or driver, which, as Pierce being the boat steer, he's going to believe that this might actually be Pierce. Now, whether he was wearing a big bird esque suit, I don't know. They might have been liberties. But um, I believe that might be a painting of him. But Cooper noted that the high class of the Japanese wore silk, the lower class wore more cotton, but they were all amazed by the Americans and their woolen clothing. They just didn't really have wool and didn't use it for clothing, so they were just really excited about it, and they actually traded a lot. So I had a nice woolen coat, and they had a nice silk coat. Easy trade, because everybody wanted a nice souvenir. The other point of interest on Manhattan was Pierce Concert, his Uncle Prince, and I found a notation of one Native American named Elazar. There might have been a few other people I have to find and see if there's like a ship log or manifest, but I don't know if that exists. But there were for certain a few people of color on the boat that the Japanese were, were as reported by several stories, very in interested about. They knew about white people um, as far as trading with the Dutch, but they, these everyday people being so closed off, they had no access to anything. So all they saw were each other and this vague idea of Dutch people. So seeing someone like Pierce, um, there was stories that Pierce and Prince would tell in their communities about when they visited Japan, where they were so confused by them as they were so dark that they would try and rub the black off of their skins and not understand that they were just dark colored, um, which is a very insane story thinking about it now. But I'm trying to, if you try and put yourself in the mind of somebody who's never seen anybody even vaguely different, it's a very interesting, odd idea. Um, and there were also stories of Pierce singing songs on the boat to entertain the visiting Japanese gentry. 
Um, an interesting thing about that, Pierce himself was a very religious man. The songs he knew in 1840 were probably mostly religiously based, specifically Christian songs. What was the main thing Japan didn't want coming to their country? Christianity. Good thing they didn't speak English. Uh, so they didn't know the songs they would be singing to entertain them. They just thought, oh, that's a nice voice. Right here, on the same page with Pierce, we have what we believe to be Mercator Cooper. They didn't really feel like finishing his hat, I guess. Um, but on Sunday, April 20th, 1845, Cooper and his crew were given wood, water, rice, rye in the grain, sweet potatoes, radishes, chickens, tea, and some crockery composed of the lacquered ware of the country. And the Japanese refused all payment for this. This was all given to them as gratitude for returning these people home. And the emperor also sent along his autograph, uh, as well as a letter documenting what they had done here. And that if Ricator ever found himself in want and need, maybe stranded on his own in some island in the future, if someone were to find it, to give him all of the courtesy that the Japanese government uh, received from him. So this was essentially a get out of jail free card if you ever pissed off a Dutch guy. Um, but once they were given all this stuff, the autographs, the, the letter, all these things, they were told very explicitly, do not come back, under no circumstances. Uh, Mercator even asked, well, what if we find, what if we leave here and we find another crew of Japanese guys? Should we just come back? And he said, no. The best bet you could do is point them in the direction of some Dutch guys and have them return them. But under no circumstances, anybody to ever come back. But this humanitarian mission took five weeks to complete. So they went five weeks out of their way to do this whole journey, and it was revealed that the only reason the Emperor Act even allowed this to occur was once he found out the particulars of everything, he believed Mercator to be of pure heart, uh, and felt that there would be no ill will allowing him to come in to do this because it's so insane to go this far out of your way at this time period to do something like that. On Monday, April 21st, 1845, due to some bad winds, the Manhattan needed a little bit of help actually getting out of Tokyo Bay, so they were towed right back out the same way they were towed in. And at this point, the Manhattan sailed north toward what is called Kamachika, Russia, and then again sent out all over the Pacific Ocean hunting whales, and eventually, on their way home, they stopped off in Amsterdam to sell all the bounty of their journey, all the oil and baleen and uh, whale bone that they might have captured along the way. And they eventually got back to Sag Harbor on October 14th, 1846, making the total journey take two years, 11 months, and six days. Almost three years out at sea doing this, which, I mean, you could take a month off if they did it all nicely. But this one here is. An interesting thing from our collection at the museum, this is on view in a, uh, our building called the Sarah Barn, where we have a whaling exhibit installed, which if you come by in the summer months, once it's not freezing, you'll be able to go inside and check it out. This was in our museum's collection and documents the journey of a few different whaling captains. Um, I'm not sure if it's that correct about Pierce's anymore. Now I've gotten a copy of Mercator Cooper's logbook and it has all his longitude and latitude lines. It actually shows the red line is supposedly Mercator Cooper's journey, and it shows him going around Africa, and then over here up through the Philippines, and then going around the Pacific Ocean. I believe he more so went down around South America and then up in this direction. I don't know. I got to read through a 200-page whaling log. I got it like two days ago. It's a lot of work. Um, but this is essentially the journey that he went on. It was down around here, and then just sailed and circled around the Pacific Ocean, all over, circling all these small little islands. Stopping off to get wood and water, catching some whales, sending mail, things like that. So Pierce eventually retired from being a whaleman, because as you get into your probably 40s or 50s, you don't really want to do this anymore, especially if you're not a captain, you're not really making that much money. And just before going out on this famous journey as we were talking about, his grandfather passed away sometime between August and October of 1841. And in 1843, just before leaving on their trip, Pierce was given the property of his grandmother due to her inability to handle her affairs. Now, I imagine that being that she was an elderly woman at this time, she maybe didn't have the financial means to take care of herself. So Pierce, as the man of the house, was just given the property to take care of that they shared together. Um, the first record of his wife, Rachel, being seen actually occurs in the same time period, too, on March 6, 1847, when they were both baptized and admitted to the First Presbyterian Church. Now, there is no marriage record, but maybe that sort of was lumped in with that as well, or just around that time period, maybe they were married beforehand, and that was just their admission to the church. 
Um, there was no actual records ever shown of Rachel working, but it was, she was known to be an expert gardener and helped out peers around the house and things like that. She didn't have a trade per se. So soon after whaling, Pierce got involved with Gold Rush. Everyone is fairly familiar with Gold Rush, as Gold was discovered in California on January 24th, 1848. The news traveled very fast. A group of Long Island men formed a company called the Southampton and California Mining and Trading Company and set sail on February 8th, 1848, on what was known as the Sabina, to San Francisco. Sabina was quickly found out to be a really bad boat. Uh, they spent almost the entire journey bailing out water, doing repairs, just barely trying to get there. They eventually landed, and uh, Pyrrhus had a little bit of money and was actually able to buy some shares in the company. So he worked on it as a, one of the seamen, piloting the boat out. I mean, given his job, he knew what he was doing, just piloting the boat out there. So he didn't need to pay his way. He could work it out and then use some of the money that he had from whaling to buy a half share in the company. So the idea was, when you go out to California, you form your company, everybody goes out and search gold. If I find gold, you all get a little bit of my gold. If you find no gold, oh no. But you're supposed to work as a team. So it, was, it didn't really work. So as the Sabina landed on August 12th, 1849, in what was known as Pittsburgh, California, the company quickly dissolved, almost, almost immediately. Some people found some gold and disappeared. Other people found no gold and hung around with everybody else who had no gold, like, what's happening? What are we doing? Um, eventually, they, uh, within nine months, the Sabina was taken back to San Francisco and sold. And that's all we know about what happened to that company. But the next time we see Pierce is December 7th, 1850, on a ship named Georgia, arrived in New York City from Havana, Cuba, by way of Charges, Panama, carrying a man named Pierce Concert, who was listed as a mechanic. Pierce most likely decided to just bail on the entire situation fairly quickly and try and head home, realizing this was a mistake. At least I got a nice trip to California out of it, hopefully. The 1850 federal census data. So this is the first time that we actually get a little bit more info, where before it would just say Pierce concert and have a line of numbers. Now we actually list everybody else in the house. So we have Pierce concert, his wife Rachel, their son James Harvey, who was two years old at the time, and his grandmother Esther. Also listed right next to him, because what they did was they just went knocking on doors down the street. His next door neighbor is Uncle Prince. He had his, his wife Mary and their daughter Harriet, who was 15 at the time. So they were marked as living right there. Um, Pierce Concert also had a second child named Charles, uh, potentially named after Charles Pelletro, who was his former owner, which is another sort of interesting, weird fact about the situation. Uh, given that Pierce would be such a heavily religious man and got his freedom a lot earlier than he should have, and Charles himself was another religious man and sort of lead what looked like a charitable life, maybe was a nicer guy, um, and that might have been why, or Pierce just liked the name Charles, couldn't tell you. So again, this is the next time we have record where he is, because unfortunately, I don't know where Gad Williams lived. Uh, that would be his grandfather. I believe Gad owns the property right here, which is where Prince lives right below and Pierce right there. I believe that because when he was given his grandmother's property and ownings, he ended up living here. There's no other record of him purchasing land this early. So I believe he might have inherited the house and then as time went on, expanded a little bit, things like that, with his brother, or his uncle, sorry, right next door. So his house, 51 Pond Lane. Pierce's home was at what is now known as 51 Pond Lane, which is at the northwest corner of Lake Agawam. Again, sort of see right over here. Uh, by 2013, the, or, the original structure was still there, and it was privately owned. It was, I'm sure as many people are aware, demolished, and eventually the property was repurchased by the village. And before the house was demolished, a lot of the structure was saved and brought back to the Rogers Mansion grounds, where it was actually stored behind one of our buildings for a few years, um, in hopes that one day the reconstruction efforts could be, could be uh, taking place. But we had our own construction project going on, so the village has since moved the building, and there's current efforts going on to try and get the property rebuilt. I have no idea where we're at with that scenario right now. But the goal is to have it be its own small historic house museum. Much like the, at the Southampton History Museum, we have the Halsey House as a representation of an early European dwelling. This would be a great representation of a mid-1800s African-American house. 
Um, it would be operated as the African American Museum and be able to tell the story of Pierce to everyone as well as African Americans in general in the region. It would be a really great opportunity to have that piece of history brought back. But right across the street, which you can go visit today, there is a small monument dedicated to Pierce right there, commemorating his life and journey as a whaleman. So acquiring more land. Pierce didn't just sit on this little property he had, he actually was able to purchase a little bit more land. My job after this is to dig through property records and then get a nice map graph so you can really see his property grow and shrink. This, this is slightly more boring. But in 1854, he purchased two acres from Savannah Town for what looked to be $150.70. Not bad. Um, in 1859, he owned almost five acres. And he was actually only taxed on three acres of property for some reason. Don't know why, but good lucky him. In 1860, he purchased another half acre from William and Abigail Jagger, who lived just like north of his property. And then he obtained the half acre estate of his uncle Prince by suing Prince's heirs to collect the debt after Prince died. Now, I don't know if Prince owed him money and what the situation was, but he was able to get that property of land once his uncle died. And then almost a few months later, after he got the property, he was able to sell two acres of his land, most likely that area included, for $3,500. So he made a nice little chunk of change for himself. So lumping together the 1860, 70, and 1880 federal census, census data, it's all kind of the same. In 1860, Pierce, now 46, is listed as a fisherman living with his wife Rachel and their son, which on the record is known as Jazz, but is their son James. I don't know if typo or they didn't want to write the whole name, not sure. But they were living together as a fisherman. In 1870, now 56, he is still listed as a fisherman living with his wife Rachel who should be 64, but she's actually listed as 60 years old on there, and is listed as keeping house as her profession. This was the first time that everybody's profession was handwritten out. Uh, their son James died in 1869 at 21 years old. There's no record as to why, at least I've been able to find just yet. Um, my guess is maybe he got sick. He could have gone out on a whaling journey of his own in search of being famous like his father. I'm not certain. Um, but Pierce owned $800 of real estate and a personal estate of $500. And by 1880, now 66, he is listed as a sailor living with his wife Rachel, who should be 74, but is now listed as 70, and she is still listed as keeping house. So maybe she was 70, not 74. I'm not sure. Unfortunately, no birth record. But somewhere around there. One of the more popular things known about Pierce is that he operated a ferry business on Lake Agawam. He retired to leave an easy life on the waters. So with his home situated right by the water, it was sort of a no-brainer to set up this ferry business, taking people from the village all the way to the beach. It was before the mention of cars, and if you want to walk down the beach on a hot summer day, well, thank you. But you could pay a nickel a ride and hop on his boat, and he would take you down. And this right here is actually believed to be a picture of Pierce on his boat. Um, he also rented out several small boats. You can rent a rowboat for 10 cents an hour, or 25 cents for a half day. But again, being a man of great faith, never worked on Sundays, you couldn't rent any boats then. Southampton's 250th anniversary was in 1890, and during that they had a big pageant where they did a lot of sort of uh, parades and things like that down at Lake Aqua. And one thing they did was highlight all the whalers that still lived in Southampton at the time. Right here on the end of this boat is Pierce Concert. So judging by how he's standing, I believe he might be either holding a harpoon gun or a harpoon of some kind, but we see a lot of other famous whalers all living right here that all these men were friends and probably worked together many times. Pierce died on August 23rd, 1897, and his wife died a bit sooner than him on May 10th, 1890. Pierce was remembered by many who knew him uh, as a great and kind man. And there's a lot of old writings that talk about different great things about him. Uh, one, one of which was Charlotte Fordham, uh, and the, who was alive in the 1970s, quote, is quoted as saying, as a person very well spoken of and well mannered, who often led the Christian Endeavor League in song and prayer, and when preaching, repeatedly determined on the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. And in an article in the Southampton Press from 1954, a man named Frank, Frank Burnett talks about his memories on Lake Agawam refers to Pierce as a good man many times throughout his article. After his death, another man named Edward Green purchased all his boats and took over the ferry business going up and down Lake Agawam. 
upon his death, also there was a man named Reverend Jesse Halsey, who was born in 1882 here in Southampton, attended the same church, the First Presbyterian, right here, and knew Pierce a little bit growing up as a young man, and later in life became a writer, and wrote a poem of sorts about Pierce here. An excerpt says, everybody trusted Pierce. Mothers sent their children to the beach. He looked after them. Many fathers had reason to trust him. They'd been to sea with him. He'd saved the lives of more than one of them. Everybody likes Pierce. Not the best poem per se, but a great <laughs> bit of info talking about everybody's love and trust of Pierce concert. He was also known as a bit of a philanthropist where when he could, he would give money always to charity. And there was actually an article where he was cleaning up a bit in Lake Agawam and found a 50 cent piece buried in the water and donated it to the Seaman Friends Society rather than keeping it for himself. And upon his death, he had about $5,000 of wealth, which he then split up and distributed to many different charities. His heirs, which he didn't have any direct heirs, sued and test the will because they wanted to get a little bit maybe of the property or a bit of money. Um, but it was will, the will was held up to be accurate because the executor, Henry H. Hildreth, um, actually had a conversation with Pierce shortly before his death, and Pierce was quoted as saying, no, not one cent, let them scratch as I have had to, in reference to wanting to share his wealth with his sort of second or third cousins. Since he didn't have any direct descendants, I mean, if my second cousin wanted my money, I'd tell him to go away in the same way. <laughs> I don't even know who they are. So his gravestone. Also imparts a really great memory of what Pierce would have been like to other people. The quote on top of it was selected by his neighbor, Elijah Root, and it says, though born a slave, he possessed those virtues without which kings are but slaves. So the fact that that's inscribed on his tombstone really just sets off from this jump how important he was to everybody in the village and how well thought of he was. And again, referring to this map, uh, Pierce's life started here at Cooper Hall. He grew up down here with Charles Pelletro. He eventually moved and had his lands right here in Lake Agawam. It is now buried right here in the North End Burying Grounds, where I stopped shop is today. Um, you can go visit his grave in Taiwan. It's probably one of the best kept graves in the entire cemetery, which is really nice. Um, and he spent his whole life living right here in the village. So he's a really, really important person to this village in particular. And another great moment that I found was in on Tuesday. July 18, 1972, a monument was actually erected in Japan commemorating Mercator Cooper and the whole crew when they did the rescue efforts, saving these Japanese sailors. Um, a man by the name of Howard Van Zandt, who's pictured right there, was the man responsible for it. He had no connection to Southampton, he was just like a wealthy businessman in Tokyo, but found out about this situation happening and just thought upon himself to get this done. Um, he was responsible for getting that there. I've been trying to figure out that monument's still there. I can't find anything, so if anyone's going to Japan soon, talk to me. Um, I think I know where it is. And it sort of creates a tangible link between Southampton and Tokyo, with this monument here and then the one we have in Lake Agawam. It's a really great link between the two cities. And so present day, as I said before, efforts are underway to rebuild Pierce's former home and turn it into a museum. There's also efforts to get his ferry boat business back up and running. A few of you may remember, a couple of years ago, they had a boat business going on, but with the pollution issues in the lake, they had to stop it. But I actually just spoke to Mayor Jesse Warren the other day about the situation. Um, they are, as many of you are probably aware, they're trying to clean the lake right now. And one of the end goals, once the lake is at a point where it's clean enough, to get the ferry boat back up and running to do tours, which would pair perfectly with the house there. <laughs> Save it. Um, but I have no timetable on that. But that is one of the goals. Uh, Pierce. Uh, Pierce's story is also a great linchpin for many talking points, talking about Pierce himself as an African-American man here in the village, just what was his life like, what was American slavery like here in Long Island, specifically in Southampton, and just whalemen in general, foreign relations. He's a great subject for many, many different people to know about. And I'm really happy to say that I spent a lot of my time educating all the small young children from Tuckahoe and Southampton elementary schools when they come to museums. And one of the main things I always do is talk about Pierce, so that way everybody is at least aware of him as an idea. Um, but that's a really great story of Pierce, and I haven't taken any questions. <laughs> questions, comments, concerns? You did a great job, thank you. Oh, you got one? <laughs> what do you reference this to? Where do you get your information? 
So all my information, or the majority of it, is right here next to me on this table. So once we're done here, if you want to come up and look through some of it, I have right here. We have some whaling logs. I have all the census data printed out here. There's two books that I've referenced a lot. There's one called A Black Diamond in the Queen's Tiara. We have a lot of copies of these at the Southampton History Museum. This was produced by a man named Arthur Davis in the 1970s. I don't know if you can actually buy it anywhere, but we have like a million copies, so if anyone's interested, come to the museum. You can sell you one, it's like a dollar. Um, and then the other book was this one named Pierce Concert Born Free, which you actually get on Amazon, so I bought this one. Um, they, they tell slightly different stories of him, because this one relies heavily on documented source material, while the other one relies a lot on oral history. But then also this one gets a lot wrong with the factual data in certain spots and oral history stuff. So I also dug around and found a lot more things, like the article I was talking about that was written in Why We Got Interviewed from the 1840s, I have it right here, um, as well as a few other things and a bunch of other news articles that I couldn't print out because they were big old crazy size. But if you're interested, I can email them to you if you want to read it yourself, things like that. Yes? The name Pyrrhus is really unusual. Do you know the origin? Is it a biblical yes. name? Yes, it's, uh, it's Greek. It's the, it's the name of the son of Achilles. Uh, so in the story of Achilles, when they sacked Troy, uh, his son was famous for killing one of the Trojan warriors, I forget their name, but that's where the name Pyrrhus comes from. How a slave or an injured servant from Southampton, whose mother's name was Violet, ended up naming her son Pierce, I don't know, but yeah.